I mean, when you think of Venezuela, I mean, the the unending, unremitting uh, stream of lies uh, that uh, emanating from the um, Western media, it, it is quite uh, stunning. Um, Elliot Abrams comes on and he's allowed to pontificate without any real pushback and without any real challenge. Uh, and as if somehow he, his views are, are, have any real merit to them. And so, you know, who, who gets the challenge? You know, you get somebody like um, uh, Max Blumenthal, he would challenge it. But it's like, you know, people who are actually doing some serious journalism, but they unfortunately are kind of you know, relegated to the internet where you know, we, we look, watch them and we think that was a brilliant performance and brave performance by Max Blumenthal, but he doesn't uh, reach the kind of wider audience uh, that needs to know something about Elliot Abrams. I mean, we just know, I mean, this is a guy who was involved in regime change wars during the 1980s. I mean, those horrific wars that went on for the entire decade in Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua. He was intimately involved in that. And now he's being brought back. Um, what do, you know, why, why was he brought back? Well, he was brought back precisely because Pompeo and the uh, Bolton wanted the replication of those very wars from the 80s to, to today. I mean, so you know, that's the striking thing that, you know, you get this, this kind of monolithic media culture in which there is really, you know, almost no real challenge to the idea that, oh, well, we're, we're of course, trying to bring democracy to Venezuela. This is the guy, Elliot Abrams. Did he bring democracy to Central America? I mean, what, you know, what, what he was doing. And, and, and I just find this really just uh, stunning. And this is why, of course, WikiLeaks is so important, because WikiLeaks provides an ample documentation uh, of those very years. I mean, of, of the, the 1980s and of those, those terrible wars that um, uh, the United States was waging. And waging for no reason whatsoever other than that uh, you know, Nicaragua had the temerity to install a socialist government. Well, no, I mean, Nicaragua you know, is a tiny country because there's no threat whatsoever to the United States, no threat whatsoever to Mexico or any country at all. The United States decided to wage this, this horrific war against it. And then uh, when Nicaragua, well, obviously trying to defend itself, you know, naturally, as do all countries in war, they impose all sorts of restrictions on um, uh, freedom of expression and so on, which is why war is not a good idea, because war is tends to be incompatible with freedom and democracy. So when, and of course, when Nicaragua does impose these restrictions, that becomes, ah, further proof that, you know, the, the Sandinistas are a totalitarian bunch. They want to introduce Soviet-style socialism in, in Nicaragua. This was the, the war that was waged by Elliot Abrams, and now he's, he's back. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's just a shocking development. Yeah, no, none of that context is given when there's a discussion of Elliot Abrams and his, his you know, contributions to the horrible suffering during that yeah. time period. None of that is, is brought up by establishment media. But yeah, yeah that, that's right. And, uh, and really, I mean, anybody who was around in the 80s will have at least remember, you know, have remember what a controversial figure he was. I mean, it wasn't just, oh, you know, he was, um, you know, convicted, eventually he was convicted of lying to Congress. And he was just a, a series of lies that, that he was um, uh, engaged in. I mean, for instance, the, the use of humanitarian aid in order to ship in weaponry. I mean, this is his fundamental violations of international law. Abrams was involved in that. I mean, this, the New York Times reported this. This isn't some fringe um, website that reported this. was in, in the New York Times. And Abrams said, oh, hey, well, you know, what the hell does it matter? And, and then they're surprised why, um, you know, Maduro says, no, we're, we're not bringing in any of your humanitarian aid. And then they're surprised why the United Nations and the International Committee of the Red Cross also said, we are not taking part in, in, in this distribution of humanitarian aid. We, we basically don't trust you uh, to be engaged in humanitarian work. You know, there's, a, there's a, a political agenda that we have no interest in um, assisting. So, uh, this, you know, the, this, this is the person here, and he just gets, gets a completely, you know, just, 
you know, un unchallenged, uh, you know, um, passage through the media, whether it's MSNBC, CNN, Fox News, whatever, whatever. He just waltzes in and, you know, well, Mr. Abrams, you know, what's happening in uh, Venezuela? Well, things are very grim. <laughs> you know, it's Maduro is doing these terrible things. And <laughs> you say, well, hey, how about doing a little bit of journalistic work? How about challenging, uh, you know, <laughs> Abrams as being some sort of a reliable uh, source on all of this? Yeah, Mary, did you have any thoughts to add on that or to respond to that? No, but uh, I mean, he, he's, he's absolutely right. Of course, this is what happens um, in the mainstream media. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the result of a lot of people who uh, know what actually happened and remember, but have a, a vested interest in not going there. And those that, that don't. Um, because there isn't that same emphasis in uh, newsrooms and um, uh, as in the past where you uh, had to research a story, you had to, you know, we, we take um, press releases, government press releases, and basically announce them. That's, that's what happens. So you don't have uh, what is presented as fact challenged uh, even when the person has um, is on the record and has had this public life uh, where um, he's done done all this stuff which is discoverable um, on the internet so um, yeah it's disappointing and and it's um, it's it's laughable except that the consequences are quite serious for society and, and for our ignorance and so this is what has happened that we have journalists who now see themselves as part of an elite. You know, you just watch the TV shows, you know, when Abrams comes on uh, and talks to the reporters. The reporters talk to him as if he's their friend. He's not, no, their job isn't really to uh, challenge him, but he's just their friend to exchange ideas and views on the world, you know, before heading off for a cocktail party. And so this is what journalists have become. They, they see themselves as part of the political establishment. Uh, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, the way the, the, this whole first name things, you know, Nick this, Elliot that, Tom this. I mean, so, you know, they're all on first name terms as if, you know, we're, we're all good friends together. Uh, just, you know, watch a, a, a press conference, uh, you know, a State Department press, press conference. And, you know, it's all on first name terms. It's all joking around, uh, you know, as if, as if they're pals together. You think, well... Don't you have a job? Don't you, you know, to inform your readers about what 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 is going on? You know, no, that's not really how they see their jobs. It's more, you know, how to feather their nest, how to advance their careers within the uh, party structure. And of course, you know, that's why you know it, it, there is almost this revolving door uh, between uh, journalism and government. I mean, you you know, you do you do a stint in the media, then you go into uh, government, then you come back into the media, then you go back into the government. So often these days, you know, you're looking at, at uh, the people on the media and you think, well, is, is he here as a, in the, his capacity as a ABC News correspondent or is he um, he's here as, um, you know, a, um, a press spokesman in waiting for the incoming Democrat administration or you know, vice versa, it could be a Republican. Is are you a Fox News uh, pundit, or are you uh, in, in training for a, a job in the next Republican administration? It's very hard to know the difference between them. And this is now, you know, and you know, and this isn't just pundits. This is, you know, this goes for, uh, you know, straight down the line uh, reporters who work as reporters, and then they go off and you know work as uh, speechwriters or PR consultants for politicians. Uh, so, you know, reporters are now no longer the sort of what they used to be, kind of, you know, who in some way saw, saw themselves as um, had to find out what government was doing. Uh, no, it's more about, you know, how, how to feather their own nest, how to advance their careers within the system. Elizabeth, can I just say... Um, yeah, go, go right ahead. That's um, very interesting. And, and it's, I have to say, though, fortunately, it's not quite as bad in Australia as it is in the United States, although we do have journalists, you know, becoming speech writers and vice versa, moving in and out of those two areas. Um, but in the US, you can, you know, all you have to do is look at these big media organisations with many millions of followers and see um, precisely uh, this being played out uh, and it's been described very, very well. Um, 
Uh, and the, the problem is that for the rest of the world, the US seems to be a, a, um, something to emulate. And if they're getting away with it, then you know, this is what is being is replicated elsewhere. People with the same interests um, are going to be doing exactly the same thing and getting away with it. You know, it's like saying, "Well, we can do that too, not just them." Uh, and and that's unfortunately then you have a, a bigger and bigger gap between the truth and the fundamental issues that are important or should be important to us. Uh, and, and all of that is suppressed for this charade, really. Um, and we, we don't want it to happen elsewhere. We don't want it to be to pervade our media the way it has um, in the United States. But there are other ways in which other destructive forces in the media too. And one's apathy. Um, uh, you know, I, I, it, the, it beggars belief that someone would become a journalist who who isn't passionate about the truth and just about you know curious and dogged. Um, but that's not 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 the case necessarily at. All today, um, you have people with multiple university degrees applying for cadetships, and they they look really really good on paper because they've got all you know they've done economics and they've done all sorts of things, and then you find that they lack the fundamental things that are uh, the things that are fundamentally important to a journalist, and you know that curiosity and that perseverance. Um, so we've forgotten what's really important and we're really going for the, um, you know, the stars and spangles um, as, as um, happens right. in the US. Brings me back again to the way in which, you know, WikiLeaks has been responsible for really not just, um, you, know, sep you know, being, uh, not just separating itself from the crowd of other media organizations in the way that it has kind of revolutionized journalism, but also its publications, especially, you know, what we saw in 2016. Um, it really has exposed, it's not only separated from, from the pack, but it's also directly exposed the media and exactly the dynamic that Mary was describing that you're discussing, where right. you have that interrelationship between the state and, and uh, political parties and the, uh, these journalists. You know, we see CIA, you know, employ, uh, you know, members coming in and, and uh, on these cable news outlets discussing issues as if they're a correspondent. It's, it's inc yes. incredible. So. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. They they come on and they um, uh, you know give give their views, and it's sort of there's a sort of un unquestioning acceptance as if you know their their views are to be taken uh, seriously. So, for instance, now um, you you obviously you've you've seen the stories about what happened in um, Madrid with the um, the storming of the um, uh, the North Korean embassy. Now, it is a shocking story. I mean, I to be honest, I I have to admit I didn't even. I, don't, I didn't know the story. I, I missed the story completely when it happened in February. So, which, which is itself yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah, because it, it's a shocking idea, the idea that an embassy was stormed uh, and we didn't know who it was. And now the, 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 the Spanish uh, uh, are reporting that there's a CIA connection, which makes, makes a lot of sense. So how is this reported? So you, you get the Washington Post. Uh, goes to some uh, ex CIA person and asks him, yeah, "Well, what do you think?" Well, I don't think the CIA was involved in this. Not doesn't sound to me like the CIA. Okay, fine, <laughs> right? So that, that, that's that. The CIA wasn't involved. I think. Well, what do you would think that some CIA person is going to say? He probably going to say, "No, no, well, no, no CIA involvement." Um, and this goes on all the time, as if you know that these people are, are telling the the truth. The same thing happens when um, that guy Paul Whelan. Um, who was arrested in Russia. Now, I don't know, you know, the story, you know, who, who knows what the story is. But, you know, what, what do the journalists do? They go asking, again, CIA people, and, say, well, do you think that um, he was an American spy? No, 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 this was, he was not an American spy. No, I think this is all Putin uh, trying to uh, uh, use some kind of a propaganda weapon against the West, or maybe he's trying to affect a swap with... Um, uh, Maria Butina, but definitely no. This doesn't sound at all like a spy. Oh, okay, right, fine. <laughs> that's like spy. I mean, so I mean, it's like you. This is this is the way that that goes on. That you know, you have this a completely uncritical spirit with a view to essentially transmit government uh, propaganda. 
Um, yeah, I think and the, the it, phrase it, the phrase state stenographer really does seem state stenographer. applicable. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, for instance, I mean, the story about um, uh, Russian uh, interference in the 2016 election. What is the source for this? Who you know? Who who's, who get, has given this evidence about this? It's entirely the, you know the product of CIA and FBI. We know who who these people are. So Brennan, Comey, uh, Strzok, uh, you know the whole bunch of them. McCabe. These are the people who sat down and wrote up um, uh, about the uh, you know Russian interference. And now this is just simply gospel truth. You know the media report this as if it's an established fact. Russia, of course, interfered in this election. They did it with a view to uh, defeating Hillary Clinton and uh, bringing in uh, President Trump. Uh, you know, what's your evidence for this? I mean, you know, the CIA said so, and therefore it must be true. And, and you know, this, this, is, this goes on all the time. And so, you know, from one, one minute it's an allegation, next minute it's already established fact. And then every single uh, media outlet reports something as an established fact. And then, of course, the effect of it is on, on most people is, well, OK, well, it's been proven. I mean, what do I know? I mean, people don't have time to start checking every single thing they read. Well, if it, they say, well, if it's been established that it's a, the Russians interfered, then Russians must have interfered. Yeah, no, I mean, you you see those exact phrases used like it is now a known fact that yes, et that's cetera, right. et cetera. That's right. And, and you know, and and I think that, that part of the reason that uh, maybe some people don't question that those sorts of statements is because there had been there is this assumption that the media is adversarial towards you know maybe the state and its claims. So if the journalists are saying it, well, they must have verified it. They're supposed okay. to double check these things. So okay. yeah, and, and I think the reality that you know you, you and Mary have been really you know. Uh, reinforcing, which is totally accurate, is that there is no adversarial relationship, and that's no. the, maybe the mis the misconnect uh, the disconnection between the reality versus what it should be, and what maybe some that's of right. the public thinks that it is. That's exactly right. And so, what what they call adversarial is really just a punch and Judy show between Jim Acosta and Donald Trump. Um, but on everything that's important, Acosta and Trump are actually on the same page. Um, they both hate uh, Julian Assange. They both want uh, Julian Assange um, uh, captured, imprisoned for the rest of his life. Um, they both are on board for every kind of uh, interventionist policy. They both uh, hate Russia like the plague. Um, and, uh, you know, they both basically, you know, don't think the public should be in thoroughly informed about anything. And, of course, they both unquestionably accept that, you know, Israel says, uh, you know, is the victim and, you know, being set upon by these monstrous Palestinians who want to drive them into the sea. So um, this, you know, on anything important, they're in agreement. But we have to go through this daily kind of punch and Judy show whereby, you know, it's, it's as if, you know, you know, they're about to start punching each other. They hate each other so much. Of so course. This is the, that, yeah. yeah this is the adversarial kind of phony adversarial journalism. That's a great point. And I think that, you know, it is, I think a lot of, a lot of independently minded journalists have pointed out that it's shocking the way in which there's this, you know, resist movement amongst Democrats and liberal journalists, except for when it comes to interventionism, whether it's in Venezuela or Syria, then we suddenly think that Trump's just wonderful and that he's yes, learning yes, yes. statesmanship. Because right. you know, so it, it's very telling, definitely. Yeah, yeah the, the, you know, that, 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 that's exactly it. Um, and so the, you know, so that's how uh, you know you get this. Well, you know, if it's adversarial, then obviously. I mean, the other day there's this guy Zucker, uh, who's the head of CNN. He collected some awards. I mean, all these people who have hold these big jobs, they're always collecting some award or other, you know, for press freedom. You know, I think uh, Chris Hedges really did sum it up perfectly when he said that it was, you know, the Ecuadorian embassy has turned into a, a little house of horrors or a little shop of horrors. And I think that, um, you know, you can't emphasize enough that that is not, you know, the result of any sort of wrongdoing on his part. That this is the result of what adversarial journalism actually, you know, is and looks mm -hmm. like in the West today. So, um, yep. You know, I've I've seen. Um, uh, yep. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's that, that that's exactly right. That's what that's what it looks like, and um, uh, and 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 that's why it just it's it's uh, it's it's just you know painful for us, you know, to watch because you know we, you know we you know we want to do something to help, but it's uh, you know but it's it's you know it is really very very difficult uh, because you know you know you know we're we're up against them. Uh, very, very powerful forces. 
Um, but but yeah, I mean, I, I think when you think of the extraordinary courage and resilience that uh, has been shown by Julian, I mean, it's just you think just being in that small embassy. This is, you know, this isn't some you know giant, you know, like the U.S. embassy in some place like you know Cardinal Mincenti, who was. Um, I can't remember, was it 15, almost 14 years he was in the, hung, the U.S. Embassy in Hungary? I mean, that's a big building. I mean, you know, you can get out, step outside, you know, enjoy the fresh air. Uh, this, this is a tiny little ap- ap- apartment. Uh, you know, you know, he, he does, it's, you know it's, it's almost just, you know, uh, I, I mean, just very disturbing even just to imagine what that, uh, what is that's like. Absolutely. I, I think Anne may have... Um returned and can join us now but yeah I completely agree and I think that um, you know we've discussed many times in the vigils but it's worth you know revisiting the fact that um, in 2015 you know now going on four years ago uh, we knew that uh, WikiLeaks published medical records that indicated the severity of the medical issues that he's suffering due to that imprisonment without medical care, you know, ranging from, you know, dental issues to the fact that, you know, his eyesight is affected by the lack of, of differing, you know, dimensions. So it's, it's definitely, it's horrendous. It has to um, stay in the conversation, um, you know, in uh, the minds of people, because if, you know, if, if vigils like this don't exist or if efforts like the socialist equality party rallies you know in over the last couple of weeks if those don't continue to happen the establishment press will be all too happy to have us all forget about that suffering um you know by Assange and now um by chelsea manning again i you know i was thinking today you know when i mean you've probably read about what's what's happening at the intercept and mm-hmm. um how they're closing down the uh, access to uh, the snowden files and the snowden NSA files, files, exactly NSA um, so they're closing that down and <clears throat> you've got to think that well, if if Snowden had passed it on to WikiLeaks, you know, we would all have had access to this. So, and exactly. we would have had access to it years ago, and then and then we wouldn't be in this situation whereby, so, uh, you know, some a, a rich person like this or media um, has basically limited access to it for years and years, and now he's closed it down altogether. So, I mean, I know I've read that you know that Greenwald is trying to get some uh, academic institution involved, and I I don't know you know whether that's going to work out. I hope it does. Uh, but I you was know, thinking, well, had it been WikiLeaks, we would all have had access to it. We, you know, we would all have been, you know, we, you know, somebody actually wrote this in a tweet. We would have had millions of uh, unpaid researchers going through this and finding out exactly what was in these um, files. Uh, exactly. As it is, exactly. You know, we haven't had that opportunity. I- and not only have they taken the documents down that they had published, but I mean, as as you know, there were how, God knows how many documents that were never published to begin with that they had held right. back, and that was a cause right. of a lot of anger amongst yes. you know the supporters of independent journalism that they did hold back these batches and batches of files. Yes. Um, you know, so I, I agree, and I think that yes. I hope that our audience is very uh, well aware of of that difference, the way in which the yes. Intercept went about that process versus the way yes. in which WikiLeaks operates. Exactly. Um, and and, and the remember, intercept is supposed to be independent. Go absolutely. ahead. No, no, I was just going to say that. And if you remember um, when Julian said something like, um, I don't really think that there should be a curator um, in between the information and the public. He right. was attacked. He was attacked by Snowden himself. And he was attacked also by, uh, by Glenn Greenwald. So, oh, no, no, we need, you know, we, we have to have curator. Well, this is what happens when well, now you have a you know, curator. Now it's been completely closed down. And so, you know, we're not going to find this out. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, so um, that that that's the that's the point. I mean, if you do, if you are going to have somebody who's going to decide how much of this we're going to uh, will release for you, well, the end result is we we don't find out, you know, what what was really in this archive. Do you have any thoughts um, on what may have motivated the Intercept to re- to remove the documents now of all times? I mean. What, do, is there any issue that is pressing um, that could have sort of impacted their hosting of these documents? I mean, I, I was always under the assumption that that Omedia was never that enthusiastic about doing this. So I don't know what right now may have um, uh, triggered this. But I mean, my, my assumption all along has been that, you know, Omedia um, just wanted to co-opt a kind of, you know, liberal leftish journalist, give him a certain credibility. But he didn't really want to rock the boat, so I think he just you know, wanted to um, essentially do fairly kind of 
you know, mainstream kind of liberal journalism. You know, he had Glenn Greenwald there, who's who's really his kind of his front man. So if you know, so if you say, well, yeah, hey, this is this is somebody who's adversarial and he is adversarial, he's you know, he's a genuine article. So he had Greenwald there, but the rest of it, the intercept. I mean, I I, I find really rather What's uninteresting. It? It's a shame and a missed opportunity because, uh, you know, the, the the kind of flagship issue of the Intercept at, at its founding, as I understand it, was the Snowden files. So for them to... That's, that's exactly what it was. Yeah. That. 